Good evening, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery with you once again, and as always, thanks for spending this half hour with me, 2% of your day. This is the China History Podcast, and we're 263 episodes into this humble effort of mine. Part 5 today of our overview of the history of those adventurous Chinese immigrants who left their families and homes in the Middle Kingdom and created new lives for themselves in today's great Kingdom of Thailand. And the famous mid and late 19th century chaos and social unrest primed the pump for the greatest wave of Chinese migration in its long history. But violence and turmoil in the homeland alone wasn't enough to cause such huge numbers. It was also the introduction of a game-changing innovation, beginning in the 1860s, of regularly scheduled steamer service between Bangkok and the major ports of Fujian and Guangdong. Once this became an established and affordable service, more of the good people of Guangdong and Fujian saw this as a very attractive life choice. We left off last time with the Anyi, these secret societies in Siam, proliferating in all the major ethnic Chinese population centers in the kingdom. All this late 19th century prosperity that flooded into the kingdom stoked the fires of illegal enterprises that came hand in hand with these economic good times. But as mentioned last time, the government took this sad song and made it better and institutionalized sin taxes that would be collected by these tax farmers I mentioned last episode. So by taxing these vices, and at least from the Treasury's uh, standpoint, a bad thing, eh, sort of, kind of, became a good thing. Secret societies and organized crime, you could find them everywhere, from Singapore in the south to the Korat Basin in Siam. And in all these places, up and down the Malay Peninsula, in between Siam and Singapore... These secret societies thrived and battled with each other for supremacy over land, industries, and opportunities. I don't want to get dragged away by the rich history of Penang, but this historic city in Malaysia was established in 1786 by the British and became a crown colony in 1867, just like Hong Kong. And a colony it remained until 1957 when it formally became part of the Malayan Federation. Now, besides all that great cooking and magnificent culture, a lot of organized crime and secret societies began there in Penang and just moved north into the kingdom of Siam. And by the dawn of the 20th century, there were as many as two dozen Anyi or secret societies just in Bangkok alone. In 1898, the Anyi or Secret Societies Act will be turned into law that effectively outlawed these criminal organizations. They had become so disruptive to society through their control of labor and organizing strikes at will and leaving the economy hostage to labor's demands, which well has two ways of looking at that. But, but generally speaking, the capitalist and ruling classes tend to frown on strikes. But as we enter the 20th century, the Chinese, who have been coming in dribs and drabs since the late Yuan and early Ming and into the Qing, were really starting to come in numbers never imagined before. The Siamese government and society at large were kind of caught off guard at the numbers of Chinese immigrants who came to the kingdom so quickly, late 19th, early 20th century. And they came for all kinds of reasons, not just to get out of harm's way. As I explained, the Siamese economy was on fire, growing at a very brisk pace. After Sir John Bowring and his famous treaty forced the rules of free trade down the throats of King Rama the Fourth's government, well, they elected to embrace everything and adapt it accordingly. And the greatest numbers of Chinese immigrants by a major landslide, and then some, were the Diochus who came originally from the Chaoshan region of Guangdong province, a part of Guangdong that's so far east, it's practically right on the border with Fujian province. It was only a three-hour car ride from Shantou to Zhangzhou or Xiamen, where the Hokkien people were concentrated. These were the two biggest linguistic groups that settled in Siam, but the Hokkien, as numerous as they were, compared to the numbers of Diochus who ended up in Siam, 
were a very distant second. And as for the other three major groups, Hakka, Hainanese, and Cantonese, they were even less numerous. But when you added all five groups up, they comprised 30 to 35 percent of the population of the Kingdom of Siam. Here in the beautiful country, Chinese Americans, it's only about one and a half percent of the population. The Hakkas from their Meizhou homeland, only a two and a half hour car ride from the port of Shanto, they shared passage on these steamers with their Diochun neighbors. Their languages were unintelligible to each other, so they probably, well, didn't have much to talk about on the voyage to Bangkok. By the 1880s, more than 8,000 Diochus per year were entering Siam. By the turn of the century, this annual figure was closing in on 50,000 per year. And as I said, the Diochu Chinese, by far, were the most numerous linguistic group to try their luck in Siam, but they weren't the only ones. And this steady torrent of immigration stayed this way all the way into the first two decades of the 20th century before things began to slow down. There's nothing like a booming economy as far as serving as a magnet for workers and thrill-seekers in search of financial gain. Along with all this wealth created through trade came demand for construction workers, artisans, and well, all kinds of services that supplied the economic good times. Rivers that had served the Siamese so well since antiquity were being replaced by roads and railroads. And who was dominant in the construction business? Well, the ethnic Chinese, that goes without saying. But it ended up being Cantonese and Hakka firms, mostly that were contracted to handle this kind of infrastructure work. The railroads of Siam that were transforming the nation, well, like they did everywhere else, well, just as the Toisan Chinese built the American railroads in Siam, it was the Diochu and Hakka workers who laid down those 3,220 kilometers of track. And as the tracks were laid and the hinterlands were tamed, the Anopheles mosquitoes feasted on the blood of these laborers and they perished by the thousands from malaria, which in turn created more demand for these men in China to pick up and leave their families in eastern Guangdong province and take that steamer voyage from Shanto to Bangkok. And whatever hinterlands were opened up by the railroads, oh, you can be sure that Chinese merchants and small businessmen followed, and these railroads were built using the kingdom's internal reserves, rather than falling into some debt trap with foreign loans. And we'll see later, they, well, they sort of overdid it with all the infrastructure projects. Now, this wasn't true in every case, but certain groups of these Chinese laborers specialized in certain industries or lines of work. The Diochus, as I said, well, they were instrumental in the building of the railroads, but they were also the ones you'd see working on the docks, loading and unloading cargo. The Hokkien, well, you'd find them mostly in the southern part of the kingdom, dominating the biggest industry down there, tin mining. The Hakkas were the petty tradesmen working in skilled professions that you know, consumers relied on, like barbers, tailors, operating family-owned dry goods stores. And the Cantonese, as I mentioned, they ran construction. As for the Hainanese, they fished, provided general labor, and cleared out the hinterlands, allowing these places so distant from Bangkok to integrate with and become a new part of the kingdom's ever-expanding economy. Before we pick up from last time with these Anyi or secret societies in Siam, let me mention another noteworthy person in the history of the Thai Chinese. This was Si Surya Wongs. He was the regent for the young king Rama V when he was in his minority. Si Surya Wongs had loyally served Rama IV, King Mangkut, and his illustrious family had served the Siamese monarchy going back to King Prasatong, who we mentioned in part one. I don't know if he had been written into the script of the king and I, but he was a very prominent person during the second half of the 19th century, all the way up until his death in 1883. He had been the one who had advised King Mankut that it was best for the kingdom 
given the circumstances, to sign the Bowering Treaty that ended the centuries-old royal trade monopoly. And this was over the hardline stance of Si Surya Wong's father, who also served the king as his Froklang. Anyway, I don't want to rehash Thai history. I wanted to mention Si Surya Wong's because he had a pretty significant impact on the lives of the ethnic Chinese who inhabited the kingdom. In many cases, going back generations, they had never been made part of the system. No one was feeling sorry for the Chinese because they were viewed as standoffish and better off economically than the rest of the good people of Siam. But most ethnic Chinese, well, they got to reside in the kingdom of Siam, but they didn't enjoy the kinds of benefits that their majority ethnic Thai friends took for granted. For the Chinese, there was only a long-standing status quo that called for their community to just take care of their own, as if they were one big happy family, or even five big happy families. So we remember this headlining public servant, Si Surya Wong's, who acted benevolently in his role of regent for a rather young King Rama V, to lead the nation through some pretty volatile times in the kingdom's modern history from 1868 to 1871. And as for Thai Chinese history, he institutionalized systems that allowed the Chinese to use their own hmm, traditional Chinese ways to look after the masses of humanity who were arriving on these Siamese shores to take part in the explosive economic growth that followed the introduction of free trade and the technical and financial innovations of the times. It was C. Surya Wongs who championed the implementation of government organs that provided the mechanism for the kingdom's ethnic Chinese to resolve conflicts, serve their most destitute and needy, and to provide some order, predictability, and structure to their daily existence. And C. Surya Wongs He wasn't shy in reaching out to the Ang Yi if he thought they would be the best ones to fix whatever problem needed to be fixed or maintain peace and serenity in certain areas where Chinese predominantly lived. And by this late in the 19th century, the Christian missionaries, first allowed into the kingdom under Rama III, were all over Southeast Asia, spreading the good word. And Siam, being as overwhelmingly Buddhist as it was, didn't quite welcome this faith, or the ones preaching it. The triads, they weren't big fans of the missionaries either, because they were always railing against them. So the secret societies were often called on by C. Surya Wongs to push back against the activities of these missionaries. These reforms he ushered in during his times as regent did wonders for the Chinese community in Siam. It wasn't anything that anyone got rich off of, but... There's often a lot to be said for an orderly and harmonious society. These measures went a long way in tamping down on rampant crime and, in a way, alleviated anti-Chinese sentiment that went along with all the violence and disorder. Matters concerning ethnic Chinese and Thai locals, that was another story. That got handled the Thai way. Rama V, King Chulalongkorn, quite a long-reigning king of Siam. He sat on the throne from 1868 to 1910, a good 42 years. With the first few years of his reign, as we just saw, was managed by his regent, C. Surya Wongs. Siam transitioned to the modern world quite seamlessly, at least compared to other Asian nations. Under its westernized King Mangkut, integration with the emerging international export trade system began ramping up pretty early, especially after the Bowring Treaty, and now under King Mangkut's ninth son, Chulalongkorn, it was full speed ahead for the kingdom. He was sitting as pretty as the Qianlong Emperor was after he got to sit at the head of the table following such excellent stewardship by his father and grandfather. Siam was by all means leaving its past behind and transforming into his modern a nation state as one can get. King Rama V 
introduced a whole slew of reforms. This included the abolition of slavery and building a completely new government and administrative organizational and power structure modeled on Western examples and introduced compulsory primary school education and military service for all males. These reforms were met with a great deal of pushback by many conservative elements in the government and royal palace. Siamese politics was as brutal and unforgiving as any rich nation's. Let me mention another watershed moment in the history of that time that really shook things up. This was the 1910 Bangkok General Strike that lasted for three days in June 1910. This event, on a simple level, was a case of the kingdom's ethnic Chinese pushing back against the government for raising taxes. In this case, a poll tax on all Chinese residing in the kingdom. The whole strike was written, produced, and directed by the Anyi Secret Societies of Bangkok, with additional support from pro-Qing dynasty royalist elements in Bangkok's Chinese community. This city was the pumping heart of the entire Siamese economy, and at the appointed hour, the city was brought to a standstill, and essential workers everywhere went on strike. Well, to make a long story short, it led to a lot of suffering and no small amount of inconvenience to the general populace. And when it really started to hurt and food was scarce, if you could get your hands on it, local resentment against the Chinese residents of the city that was always mildly percolating under the surface started to become more open and palpable. In such a short time, only a few days, the Bangkok Chinese community sent a strong message of resistance to the government. But looking at it another way, it ended up being a blow to the Chinese community. First off, not everybody was on board with the whole idea. Many were against it, and even more didn't get involved and just remained neutral. The Chinese powers within the community, in lockstep with the Anyi of Bangkok, indeed, taught the government a lesson as far as what they were capable of. We saw going back to Taksin the Great, following the destruction of Ayutthaya in 1767, how the monarchy, in its desperation to bounce back from quite an upheaval, had made an unofficial alliance with its industrious and commercial-minded Chinese subjects to promote trade and commerce and in so doing, build the economy of the nation, not to mention the monarchy. And even though King Rama V called in the army to break this strike and go after all the ringleaders, the government now knew their partner in creating this prosperous and economically vibrant society demanded a certain degree of respect and laissez-faire treatment, and that the tail can wag the dog if it wanted to. Well, the powers that be had to remain cognizant of that, whether they liked it or not. Politically, for the Siam monarchy, this 1910 Bangkok general strike also proved to be a turning point in the handing over of a large degree of power and authority to the state and the military. And as for the centuries-old cushy alliance between the kingdom's ethnic Chinese and the Siamese monarchy, well, that too took a hit, and the power paradigm at the pinnacle of Siamese politics began to shift away from the Grand Palace. Even up to then, the Kingdom of Siam was still what you could call an absolute monarchy. Integrating with the global trading system so quickly and on such a scale like Siam did, well, I guess you could say things became a little bit too complex to leave in the hands of one hereditary monarch in his court. This kind of economy that Siam was enjoying needed a lot of government departments and ministries to keep the royal barge of state steady as she goes. Well, King Chulalongkorn, Rama V, he had been king since he was 15 years old, back in 1868. As liberal and progressive monarchs go, he's right up there. He reigned a long time and set the country in a nice, positive trajectory. There were confrontations during his reign with France and 1892 that pushed Siam out of Laos and Cambodia, leaving those two peoples to their French-Indo-Chinese fate. 
And with Britain in 1909, Siam was forced to hand over the states of Perlis, Kedah, Terengganu, and Kelantan. So when King Chulalongkorn's son, Wacharavut, was crowned King Rama VI, the nation of Siam was sitting in a very nice place. And as for the 1910 general strike and all the riots and unrest that brought Bangkok to a standstill, well, that ended up being the same year that King Rama V passed from this earth. And the new king, Wacharavut, Rama VI, he put the blame for his father's demise solely on the Chinese of Bangkok and their Hangi leaders. In 1914, this king, Rama VI, well, he's going to take a swipe at the Chinese. I don't know how widespread this was meant to be or which audience the king was playing to, but he had to have known this was certainly going to raise a few eyebrows in some corners. This king, Rama VI, he was smart and educated. His father, King Chulalongkorn, saw to it that he had a proper education at Sandhurst and Oxford, which would make one in King Wacharavut's royal shoes either a Brit hater or an Anglophile. And he was the latter, and in quite a big way, I might add. So he wrote this piece, and it appeared in a leading national journal, and really laid it all out as far as what the secret and not-so-secret grievances of the non-Chinese inhabitants of the Kingdom of Siam had for their ethnic Chinese fellow citizens. The piece was called The Jews of the Orient. This is really more anecdotal history than hardcore history, but the matter of the ethnic Chinese in Siam up to now, and going back to Taksin, and even earlier to the Ayutthaya Kingdom, well, a lot of the local Thai majority who lived amongst them or depended on them, well, let's just say they had a few things to say about the Chinese that, well, they wouldn't say it if any Chinese were within hearing distance. But King Rama VI, he was not so shy. And when he compared the ethnic Chinese inhabitants of his great and prosperous kingdom to the Jews, well, I don't think he was using the Jews in a complimentary way. King Rama VI was sponsoring a new kind of Thai nationalism. And despite the Chinese DNA and his makeup, the Chinese residents of the kingdom were about to get an amuse-bouche, so to speak, of what was to follow. In King Wacharavut's essay, well... He must have been inspired by the Protocols of Zion, because some of the claims he made were a rehash of that 1903 Russian document. He described the so-called Jewish problem in Europe and all the classic things about the Jews that people pointed to. Uh, Perpetual outsiders in the societies they dwelled in, never assimilate, and all these innate money-making skills and their worship of mammon and all the uh, usual stereotypes. And after mentioning all this... King Rama VI built his case by drawing all these parallels between Siam's Chinese ethnic minority and the Ashkenazi Jews of Europe. And after building up his case, the king made a few accusations and points to support his argument. The ethnic Chinese, they took all the benefits that the nation offered and offered no loyalty in return. And they thought they were superior and more civilized than the local Thai majority. And their loyalty was to China, not to the king of Siam and the nation. They all lived together in their communities and didn't mix. And they only spoke their languages with each other. And then there was the Angyi and the triads and secret societies and all the crime and societal unrest that was associated with that whole world. He even went as far as to call the Chinese chameleons who speak Thai, hang out with Thai people, call themselves Thai but only when it is convenient or expedient. Otherwise, they live in their own Chinese worlds and live their Chinese lifestyles. And even their embrace of Buddhism, he derided as opportunistic. The king claimed the Chinese would practice Hinduism or Christianity if it was beneficial to whatever it was they were seeking. Rama VI, bottom line was this, quote, One is either Thai or Chinese. He cannot be both. End quote. And no mincing words when he argued, quote, like vampires, the Chinese would suck the lifeblood and fatally drain the fledgling Thai nation state if they were not brought under control, end quote. He had once said, not in this essay, but had addressed his people saying, quote, 
I do not ask you to hate Chinese. I only ask that you think more of yourselves. You who are Thai must do more for your own nationality than you do for the Chinese. Whenever you must choose between what is of benefit to the Chinese or the Thai, there should be no question. You should choose the Thai. That is my only wish. End quote. You know, many people have said this whole thing about the, the Jews of the Orient article was overblown and that the king was playing to a specific audience when he wrote that piece, you know, shouldn't be judged too harshly. Eh, who's to say? It's not like he was revealing any big secret. The ethnic Chinese had had that albatross of success around their neck for <laughs> quite a while, and resentment against them began to manifest itself in more ways than in the past. And King Wacharavut wasn't the only one comparing Siam's Chinese to the Chosen Ones. There was a gent from the British Foreign Service of some note, Herbert Warrington Smythe. He was one of those Britishers who served as an advisor of sorts to a number of rulers, including the King of Siam. He wrote an 1898 book called Five Years in Siam, Volumes 1 and 2. I saw it on Amazon for 2375 bucks. Let me quote something Smythe said. Quote, the Chinese are the Jews of Siam. They have, on the whole, enjoyed an immunity from official interference, which they have neither merited nor appreciated. Their only return has been the species of high-handed rowdyism which results from the methods followed by Chinese secret societies. By judicious use of their business faculties and their powers of combination, they held Siamese in the palm of their hand. The toleration accorded them by the government is put down to fear. They bow and scrape before authorities, but laugh behind their backs, and they could sack half a Bangkok in a day. End quote. Yes, H. Warrington Smythe. He was also a subscriber to the whole, you know, yellow peril theory that was making its way around the Western world that saw Orientals and Asiatics, as Asians were called by those types, as this existential threat. So not surprising, yeah, he had nothing uh, good to say about the Chinese. During the reign of Rama VI, the population of Siam reached over 10 million people, and as much as a third of that population were ethnic Chinese, no place else on planet Earth had more Chinese living in their country, except China, of course. In the 100 years leading up to the founding of the PRC in 1949, over 20 million Chinese will head for the exits, and about half of that number made a new home for themselves somewhere in Southeast Asia. The Chao Sua and Chao Mong elites around Bangkok and the surrounding areas and all the way down the Malay Peninsula, more than ever before, they had to really go to great lengths to show their utmost loyalty and devotion to the king and country. Because of their high profile and the way public sentiment was leaning, they were always suspect. The rank-and-file working-class Hua Gong Chinese workers, eh, less concern was paid to them as they tended to more readily melt into the Thai pot after a generation or three. King Wacharavut's reign from 1910 to 1925 witnessed the Bolshevik Revolution and the founding of the Communist Party of China. And you could be sure these ideas all wafted into Siam. And the Thai monarchy, not to mention the government, <laughs> cast a gimlet eye on anyone espousing those kinds of ideas. And that went for Sun Yat-sen and all of his followers, too. No king, emperor, or dictator was ever amenable to those kinds of ideas and preferred not to have any of that in their lands. And we'll see. First, it was the taint of republicanism that made the Chinese suspect. And then later on, it will be the stink of communism. And the ethnic Chinese of Thailand will often be cast as sympathizers. So Siam's Anglophile king, Wacharavut, Rama VI, he's called the father of the first Thai nationalist movement. The first and not the last. Well, I think you all get the main idea. Why don't we just put down our tools and call it a day right here. We'll pick up next time and travel through the war years, 1914 to 1945. You won't want to miss all that. And once more with feeling, may I humbly remind all y'alls, there are other ways to show some extra support for this family program that's been around for how long? Ten years? More than ten years. 
there's patreon.com backslash China History Podcast. And if you're like my man Rich Mitch and that great country where we have such a special relationship, you can hit me up via PayPal, paypal.me backslash China History Podcast. Either way, you'll have my eternal gratitude. Okay, you beautiful and good-looking listeners, that's all I got for you this time. Thai Chinese History Part 6 next time. Getting to the end. Or as far as I plan to take it. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from COVID-infested Los Angeles, California. See you in a couple weeks for another exciting episode of that China History Podcast.